Romans, Romans chapter 1, and uh, this evening we're going to be looking at the next portion of our statement of faith. I believe we have it up on the screen, it should be there. Um, We'll read it together once it is up. We're continuing to think about the doctrine of man, humanity, anthropology, whatever you want to call it. So uh, once that is up, we'll read it together, but uh, I'll read the statement now, and then we'll uh, look at the, the Scriptures so that we can be absolutely assured that what we believe and confess is drawn from God's Word. There it is, actually. We can all read it together. We believe it is utterly beyond the power of fallen man to know God, to love Him, to keep His laws, to believe the Gospel, to repent of sin, or trust in Christ. Oh, I am sorry that after um, a potentially heavy passage this morning, that um, it seems that it is God's design to humble us still further by reminders of our total inability. But that is clearly what God has planned. We do believe this, and we confess this. We can say it with our chests even though it is something of which I can speak personally, I am deeply ashamed. My inability in myself to know God. It's not not something to boast in. My inability to love Him, to keep His laws, to believe the Gospel, to repent of sin or trust in Christ in myself. That is something that that should sober us. Should it not? That is something that should humble us. We, we, we've been looking at this, this doctrine of humanity and we've had a couple of weeks already looking at it. We ask the question, what is wrong with the world? Do you remember the answer? What is wrong with the world? We are. Sounds nihilistic, doesn't it? It doesn't sound very nice. That's how G.K. Chesterton answered the question when um, uh, he read a newspaper article uh, uh, asking what was wrong with the world. He wrote, I am. Because he had, for all of his um, uh, later theological challenges and flaws, a real sense of man's sinfulness. I think if, if we are honest, even people who reject the gospel even people who do not believe in Jesus, who have not been saved, know something of their total inability. I I told you about these WhatsApp groups I'm in and Facebook pages and things like that, community groups, all sorts of stuff that I do to try and keep an eye on what's happening locally, finger on the pulse of the community and whatnot. And the repeated question surfaces, what's wrong with people? And it's normally that sort of aghast, shocking most of the time, it doesn't merit that. Like, you know, some, some, someone was mildly unpleasant in the queue at the shops, and they're like, oh, what is wrong with people? You know, that type of thing. Um, there are serious things out there that they could ask that about, I'm sure. However, another sentiment, though, that we see that's more self-reflective is helplessness. A real sense of helplessness. Total inability to, we know it in our own church, to advance in employment. Have you felt that? To climb the ladder. Total inability to get out of the various messes you've gotten yourself into. And those might be uh, connected to sin. They certainly are connected to life in a sinful world. It could be financial. It could be emotional. It could be relational. How do I get out of this? Helplessness is total inability. I am unable to sort things out. It's out of my control. How many times do you hear that even? Do you go to the, um, the hospital in very severe cases? Uh, eventually someone will say, it's out of our hands. Total inability. See, there are areas in our life where we affirm our total inability to do things, to get things done. Is that that fair? 
Why then do suddenly we realize ability to reach God? You're talking about this, someone inevitably gets defensive. It's like, no, 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 I, I can reach God. Then why don't you? I can keep His laws. Then why haven't you? I can believe the gospel, then why, well, why didn't you at first? Uh, and, and these are the, the things that are a part of our residual pride. I say this as someone who acknowledges there are Christians who in some moment of spiritual immaturity or biblical illiteracy will reject the concept that is before us this evening. And yet it is manifestly clear. You go to Romans chapter 1. Let's read from uh, verse, uh, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And stop there. I'm not going to be expounding those verses. If there is a set of verses that I've expounded more than any others, um, uh, well, pastor of this church, it's probably those verses. There's a couple of other contenders, but there, there is not just several sermons. There's a sermon that I have preached multiple times from that passage. Continue reading. And this is where we get to the, the nuts and bolts of our um, our. our message this evening, our confessional statement. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature." And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's a very grim read, is it not? But it is extremely reflective of the world in which we live. What happened? Well, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But to summarize, this is from the Second London Baptist Confession. It says... God has endued the will of man with natural liberty and power of acting upon choice. That it is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. Man had in his state of innocency freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God. But was yet unstable so that he might fall from it. And that's what he did. There was a choice. He could freely choose. He chose wrongly. 
He chose to rebel against God. It's a simple thing and a severe thing. In a split moment, he chose death over life. The way of destruction over the way of the eternal creator of the universe. And so the, the confession continues more in depth than the statement. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. You cannot will yourself to salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. There are plenty of other passages we could go to to demonstrate these truths from Scripture. We could go to Romans chapter 8 where he talks about uh, that which is of the flesh, loves the flesh, desires the flesh, craves the flesh, all of that. That which is of the Spirit seeks life, yes? There's a distinction between the flesh and the Spirit that is throughout the New Testament. The flesh is is, we are told, bound by sin. The language of slavery is used of our will. Is it not? Or am I just making that up? We're bound. What, have, what is it from which Christ has set us free? We have to start, before we get to Christ, we have to start here. In this uncomfortable truth of a will that is bound and enslaved to sin. Unrighteousness. The world, the flesh, the devil. How do we deal with that? Well, the reality is we don't. Really. We're slaves to it. Elsewhere, we're told we are dead in our trespasses and sins. What does that mean for our will? Have you ever said we have free will? Yeah. Have you ever heard someone else say man has free will? Yes? Well, I, those who know me well know I, I like to reason with people. And so I can, I, I can know, suppose Philo, you come to me, brother, and you say, yes, but man has free will. Okay, I'll work with that. I know you mean something different to what I mean. But I'm going to work with that. Yeah, we have free will. We're free to do that which conforms to our nature. Yes? We're free to comply within the boundaries which we are given. I mean, are we free people tonight? Absolutely. But there are laws, there are rules, and there are regulations, and there are various things that are governing our existence. Some things that are unseen, that are created, and some things that are, are imposed, that are legislative. But we're free, yeah? Yeah? So what do we say about the will of someone, the free will of someone who is dead in their flesh? Dead in their trespasses and sins. Are you tracking with me? You are free to do what dead people do. You are free to choose as dead people choose. You are free to engage as dead people engage. All of this. You are, you are free to exist as those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And, and, and thus, you are oriented towards what? Trespasses and sins. Moral decay. Depravity. That's the list of things that we know are wrong. We, are, we know it at least intellectually. If not, if, if not really, we know things are wrong. We know that God has made decrees against things and the practice of these things. We know that these things have a penalty, including, that is, death. We deserve to die, but we not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Paul uses as a foremost um, example of this homosexuality. We have to say it. These are days of great, overt... Moral confusion and depravity. Wanton rebellion against God and His design. 
It's a very, very, um, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know this, I trust, deeply unsettling and unpopular thing to say. God is clear in His Word. It does not matter what the public opinion is. It does not matter what the pressure on you in your workplace is or in your place of education is. Let God be true and every man a liar. And I know that you're under, many of you, um, sometimes you feel at least psychologically under intense pressure, not simply to accept these things, not simply to tolerate people who are conducting themselves in this way, but in, in fact to celebrate and to give approval. And this text actually mentions that specifically. They do not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Paul uses that as um, his starting place, his launch pad, as an example almost to jar us into a, 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 an a, a alert posture. Okay, something has really happened with us that, that's deeply unnatural. Not, not at all a, a part of how He created us to be. But it goes back before that. Before we chose to do unnatural things, we chose to worship unnatural things. What is natural? Worshiping God. Worshiping our Creator. But that wasn't good enough for us. We had to worship ourselves. We had to worship things that were created instead of the Creator. We chose to worship the word of a possessed serpent over the word of a loving God who walked and talked with us in the garden. We chose to worship the perception of our eyes and our taste cravings. It looked good. It was pleasing to the eye and it was good for food. And so we chose to worship ourself. We chose to worship our aspirations because we wanted to, to be like God and we failed to see that we already were like God. And so we exchanged those, that, those ways in which we were like God for the one area in which it might be said we were not like God. Losing all of that to gain what? The knowledge of good and evil and how depressing that has been. Dishonorable worship. Dishonorable and unnatural worship has led to unnatural practice. There's no way out of it. There's no way around it. Of course, the Apostle Paul does not limit himself to that one behavior. He does not simply leave it with those who are, 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 are practicing homosexuality and fulfilling, as he calls it, dishonorable passions among members of the same sex. But he says they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness beyond this. That's an example of how unnatural things have gotten, yes? But look at all of this. Lest anyone say, oh, yeah, oh, moral depravity. Because there are plenty of people out there who don't believe in God and who don't believe in the gospel who do have a sense of sexual morality, of, of what's natural and unnatural. Yeah? Some of them are nice enough. Some of them are quite cruel. Some of them are uh, downright abusive. And um, uh, there are people who I know personally who have either been sexually assaulted or um, uh, physically assaulted because of their perceived, and I'm just using the, the language, you know what I'm saying, their perceived sexual orientation. So my friend going into the corner shop and some nasty man on the other side of the counter somehow walking around and, and, and sort of pinching his bum and giving him a wink. Is that acceptable behavior? Absolutely not. I, I went to the shop and, um, um, you know, 
had a very stern word with him. I think I got myself banned. I know they called the police on me um, after that. You know, does that make me, and as, as they say in, the, um, in that circle, an ally of the uh, LGBT movement? No, not at all. It makes me a human being who knows what's right and what's wrong and what's appropriate behavior and what's inappropriate. There are plenty of other things that people do. There are things that I have done. There are things that you have done. Envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slander, hating God, insolence, haughtiness, boastfulness, inventing evil, disobedience to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless stuff. that We, we, we want to sift it and scale it in, in certain ways, but we can't escape that, that he, he puts envy next to murder in this passage. Truly, our heads, our hearts, and our hands are stained by sin. Think of it this way. The text communicates to us these three things very briefly, which are outlined in our statement. If our statement is still there, we believe that it is utterly beyond the power of fallen man to know God. How might we summarize that summary? It's already a summary, but how can we summarize it further? Our minds are darkened. Sin, as we have it in our nature, has produced minds that are darkened. The text which we have read says that repeatedly. That we have become futile in our thinking. That our, our foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Makes absolutely no sense. Two, I'd say two weeks ago, no, one, one week ago, yesterday, um, I went to visit my neighbor, Dennis. I've told many of you about Dennis before. Dennis was the longest time resident of Park Ridings. He was living in his house since 1936. When he was a three-year-old child, he moved onto the street. He used to go to Sunday school in uh, the back hall. He stopped going to Sunday school at the age of six because even way back then, they teased Christians or churchgoers on the playground. It's not a new development. There's always unbelievers in this world. And the unfortunate thing is, he decided he would rather become one of them than suffer their, their teasing. So he went home and he announced to his mom, who professed to be a Christian, I don't want to go to Sunday school anymore. And very foolishly, she let him make his own decision. And so he lived the whole of his life only darkening the doors of the church, best I can tell, for weddings and perhaps funerals. I asked him, what is he? He doesn't believe in God. So I said, oh, so you're an atheist. Yeah, I suppose so. He's in hospital when I first met him. Um, after I not first met him, when I first helped save his life on that occasion, he's in hospital. And I asked him at his hospital bed, and he confirms he's an atheist. The nurse comes around and asks him what he is, and he says, Christian? C of E? I had to fill out the form, and I was like, wait a second, mate. I, just, I literally just told you you're an atheist. And you said, yeah, I suppose so. No, oh, well, I, was, I was baptized. My religion is Christian. And I couldn't explain it to him. Why? His, his foolish mind is darkened. He ha, he, he's literally trying to play both teams. Oh, I was baptized as a baby, and then I went to the Sunday school. Okay, that's that's. That's me squared away with God, just in case He is real. But really, I've lived my life not acknowledging Him. Darkened mind. Several years later, quite a few years later, the census came around. You remember, just a couple of years, wasn't it? The census. So I'm determined to lend my efforts to accurate and honest census making. But I cannot fill out the census for Him because that would not be right. I have to... Fill it out for him. He has to tell me what he's going to answer. And I have to tick as he wants me to. 
We get to the religion one. And I thought, finally, this is my moment to talk to him about these serious, weighty matters he never wants to discuss with me. What do you believe, Dennis? Christian? Dennis, we've had this chat before. I don't think you're a Christian. Do you believe? Do you even believe in God? Yeah, I suppose I do. Okay, that's a new development and a pretty big one. You do believe in God? Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. What do you want? I, I, my, my hands are clean. What do you want me to put down? And I'll put down what you think is the honest answer. And he insisted on me ticking the Christian box, like so many across this nation. So I ticked the Christian box. A week ago yesterday, I decide I'm going to capitalize, sorry, it seems crass, I know, but on the Queen's passing and talk about death and life after death. Seems a pastoral enough thing to do, doesn't it? Although it's a difficult thing to do when there is a man in his late 80s that looks like he is dying in the bed next to you. You don't want him to die like right there in your hands as you're, because he finds you aggressive or something. So I was, you know, I'm trying nonetheless to make the point incredibly difficult. Didn't want to talk about it. You know, the heavy breathing. <sighs> yes, it's a difficult one. Always lots of disagreements about religion, politics. These are things we don't really talk about. You know, that sort of thing. And so I'm distinctly realizing he does not want to talk about this. But I keep prodding. Desperate, clutching at straws because he's not a great conversationalist. And, uh, you know, did he watch the, the, the funeral did, at all? Did, you know grasping for the scripture reading on the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by me yes well but i suppose he says most i've gotten of a confessional statement i suppose some of us are believers and some of us are unbelievers and that's just the way it is and i said so what are you what are you Well, I, I guess I'm an unbeliever. I always thought believing in God was a bit far-fetched, really. So I felt like we we're back to square one. I, I, I preferred his census answer, dishonest, though I was sure it was. Doesn't matter how many times I told him, actually, I find it more far-fetched not to believe in God. As I, as I poke and as I prod and as I ask and talk with so many people, they don't have reasons. There's not a reasonable answer to the question. They think they do sometimes, but when you get down to it, it is often very superficial. And this particular man especially. Sentiment. I just found it a bit far-fetched. No sense of the supernatural. No sense of the miraculous whatsoever. Nothing of the Spirit. Everything of the flesh. An illustration of one whose mind is darkened. And yet God has revealed everything we need to know. It's there. Romans chapter 1. If we were to do a deep exposition of this, we would see more about what God has revealed in creation. Romans chapter 2, we would see what God has revealed so that we might know Him in our consciences. So even if He's holed up in His bed and if the TV shuts off and He can't watch His nature documentaries and um, He's just sat there in bed and all the electricity's cut and it's just darkness and He's looking up at the ceiling, there's something inside Him that tells Him about good and evil and right and wrong. There's a conscience. He's able to reflect at the end of his life on the things that he's said, thought, and done over the course of his life, some of which may weigh heavily upon him. I know because sometimes the way he has spoken to me and treated me, he has come back to weeks later and apologized. 
He has a conscience. But he doesn't see that the conscience is pointing him to God. Romans chapter 3. Christ. For there is a way to righteousness apart from works of the law. God has revealed Himself to us in Jesus so that we can know Him. And so what do we do? We go out and we knock on doors. We go out and we do evangelism on the high road. We make friends and share the gospel with them. We post scripture verses on WhatsApp groups and online forums and social media. We preach week in and week out the gospel of Jesus Christ that you, though far from God, can be brought near to God and have hope of eternal life and help now to live in godliness. And no one cares. Well, some do. Let's not be morbid about it. You care. I trust. But friends, why do people not care? Why does it seem so hard? Why do you labor and there is no belief? Because our minds are darkened. Why did people labor with you for years and there was no belief? No understanding. And even now, there may be belief. And even now, there may be some measure of understanding. But even now, all of us suffer blind spots. Yeah? All of us have areas in our hearts and minds that aren't fully sorted out. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you remember from when we were talking about Scripture, that, that um, the... Uh, the Word of God is breathed, it's breathed out. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And, and he uses a phrase in there that, that it is for setting straight. For ironing out. Why? Because we're all crumpled. There's a lot that's wrong with our minds. Not only are our minds darkened, which we could talk about and illustrate even more, but our affections are depraved. So, so, we don't love Him. Or at least we didn't. It is not within our power, in our flesh, as fallen people, to know God or to love Him. We, we trust in Jesus Christ and we believe that He has remade us in the image and likeness of Jesus. We're dead to sin and we're raised to walk in newness of life. We're a part of a new humanity. I'm conscious that the vast majority of you in this room profess faith in Jesus. Yes? And so you, you can say, I, I do love Him. I do love Him. But not by your power you don't. Something changed. Some, something changed completely. You didn't always love Him. It was through the motions. Now you look at it perhaps, I know I do. How can this man not love Jesus? How can my neighbor not love God? Not be overwhelmed by the beauty of the universe? Not be prompted by the meticulous detail of the human conscience and the uh, intricate moral system and, and, and value system that it has that had to come from somewhere. How can he not be captivated by good news of salvation? I mean, I was so desperate. You know, he, he's there on his bed, not talking to me, uh, at least in a way that I can really latch hold of anything. So uh, how do I keep... So pressing in with the gospel, he said something about the, 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 the queen and how he was going to miss the Christmas talks, the Christmas speeches. And so I, I remembered one of hers where she, she was more explicit than ever about, about Jesus. And it was, it was lighter than I was being, but I was like, okay, I'm going to put this on desperately, hoping I could at the end, because she quotes... She quotes, I did a few weeks ago after she died, she quotes the, the carol, the Christmas carol, O oh, oh little child of Bethlehem, this sin to us we pray, cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. 
she quotes that at the end of the speech. And so I showed that to him. And then I was like, so what did you think of that? And here's the thing. His mind is darkened. What did you feel when she was talking about that? What, what could he say? Because his affections are depraved. He's not thinking spiritually. And you could say that of anyone. You can say that of yourself. All of us can say that of ourselves. At some point, we didn't love God. We made a show. There was some pretense. And there are so many ways in which our affections are, are torn. We need to be renewed. As the apostle himself said, I die to sin daily. There are things that we love that we shouldn't love. There are things that we hold on to that we, we, we shouldn't hold on to. Affections that we have that make us um, uh, defensive. Um, uh, and, and again, um, you know, uh, we, we, we don't like these idols being taken from us. Why do you think people exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things? Because they liked mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. They had, maybe they didn't like them. Maybe they lived in fear of them. That's how many idols are developed, is it not? And so the thunder and the lightning. So we're going to build a mythical deity around these forces of nature that are outside of our control. But we're never going to reach higher than the thunder and the lightning and the force itself to who created it. We're going to create pantheons of deities for every, every natural force and, and every human behavior. And if you look at the, the, the gods that were worshipped at the time uh, by people in the city of Rome, they reflect people at their worst. Have you ever read the classics? Have you ever read... Greco-Roman mythology. I, I, I confess, I, I, I did. Yeah, I definitely did. Um, I find it fascinating, very interesting. And um, it, it, some of it is very interesting to read, and some of the stories are great to tell. And yet there was a, also an adolescent element of it that, you know, it, it, they, they were very naughty. You know, and you, you're like, oh, this is, you know, I'm reading this sort of trashy, soap opera of a story. It, 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 some of it's obscene, in fact. Paul knows that. He would have been conversant in the literature of the cultures to which he was ministering. And he knew that people didn't love God, but they loved themselves. So they became lovers of self instead of lovers of God. And in loving self, they chose their own desires, the fulfillment, the practice of their own desires. The desires are sinful. We have to say that because there is a movement that's trying to compromise on this and is saying that, okay, it's just the practice that's the sin. The desire is sinful, friends. The desire is sinful. And the action. No, I, I, you know, I guess if I'm like, okay, would, would I rather one of the two, I'd rather someone just be battling a desire and trying to kill that than acting it out. Absolutely. There are different consequences and different things like that that we, we see. However, sin, affections that are depraved. Finally, our efforts are defective. It's utterly beyond the power of fallen man to know God, to love Him, and to keep His laws. So you try to do good and you fail. You try to do what is righteous and you fail. You realize, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 3, none is righteous, no one, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. You don't even try, actually, really. But when you try, you fail. What about believing the gospel? There are some people who would be with me all the way up to this point. And they would say, oh, uh, there I disagree with you. We have power to believe the gospel. We do have that power. And that's where these battles, old battles over free will come back up. There was a 
there was a British monk and an African theologian, Pelagius and Augustine. And you, there's a, won't get lost in all of the history. You can research them later. But the, um, uh, the, the British monk Pelagius said that we had free will to believe in God without any external or internal influence from God. Augustine said, not true. We must be made alive by the Holy Spirit. It is utterly beyond our power as fallen people. And he could testify to that from his own life experience. He had an unbelieving father who introduced him to a world of sexual immorality. He, in his own free time, would, um, uh, w- w- was just a rascal and he'd go around stealing just for kicks. One of the things that haunted him seems mild compared to some things that people get up to, but haunted him as an adult was memories of stealing fruit from his neighbor's garden and then just pelting pigs with it. It wasn't because he was hungry. It was just for the ride. That's why. The emotional high. The adrenaline of theft. His mother prayed for him. One time he got sick and he wanted to be baptized. But he didn't really believe the gospel. He resented her for it.